ultimately you absolutely need experts you absolutely do need those people that are computer scientists and hard- hardcore coders and so on and so forth but to actually deliver value you need the perspective of other people particularly if those people are representative or even better are the users of whatever it is you're trying to do so there's a place for everybody in technology I've always looked up to this organization as being a triumph for UK public sector. Uh, Charlie Ewan is the CIO, the Chief Information Officer of the, the Met Office or the Meteorological Office, to give it his full title, uh, leaving school to go straight into the RAF. I, I think it's fair to say that Charles hasn't taken a conventional career path for a CIO. Uh, he has spent many years in commercially led roles too, and all this cu- culminated Uh, 12 years ago when he took the audacious decision to take a 30% pay cut and join the world-renowned Met office. Um, He has since worked his way uh, to the summit of the technology seam of the organization and is now at the forefront of some of the most technologically advanced endeavors by any UK entity. Aside from the weather, of course, we, we also discuss quantum computing, satellites, climate change, and also protecting your own and the, and and, the, and your team's mental health, uh, especially through through the pandemic and lockdown periods, uh, and also leadership lessons Charlie has learned from sport uh, and and science fiction, something which he is very passionate about. You absolutely do not want to miss this one. He's a great guy, great talker, very passionate, unorthodox background. I think he's a modern tech leader. I think it's it's pretty fair to say it's Charlie Ewan. Charlie, how, how are you today? Thank you for coming on the Tech Leaders Podcast. Not at all. Nice to see you, Gareth. Very well, thank you. And how are you? Yeah, I'm very well, thank you. And uh, it's good to sort of return to a, a version of normality. I'm here in the studio in Cardiff, and uh, I've been really looking forward to this one. So first of all, Charlie, I know everyone knows what, where the, you know about the Met Office, a little bit about the Met Office, but um, they may not know who you are. So if, for, for the listeners who don't, uh, could you give us a, like a brief indire- introduction to yourself? Maybe a little summary of your career from sort of the point of education right up to the present. Sure. So I'm Char- I'm now Charlie Ewing, Director of Technology at the Met Office. Uh, I'll come back to that at the end. Um, but started off life as as Charlie brought up in the uh, middle of Devon on my parents' pig farm and uh, one of five siblings. So um, I'm not claiming poverty. I was privileged in many ways, uh, but economic privilege wasn't one of them. So uh, it became apparent that university in the standard route, I wanted to, always good at science, always like maths and computer studies and science and all those kinds of things. Um, and really had, uh, decided that I was going to go to university to do physics. Um, that, for all kinds of complex reasons, became obviously not possible at 16. So um, I did some, left school at 17 uh, and did a few kind of normal local jobs uh, of various descriptions and uh, decided that wasn't for me. So so looked around to where I could get an education for free and went into what you would now refer to as a modern apprenticeship with the RAF, Royal Air Force. Um, so this was the apprentice scheme, boys entrance scheme uh, that they used to run, where I studied um, avionics and electronics uh, at Cosford in the Midlands uh, for three or four years. Then I subsequently went on to uh, go up to Oxford and in the, in the RAF proper um, for a little while as an engineer. Uh, that, uh, that uh, well, then, then I got hooked up. Uh, with my current wife, Alison, uh, and they wanted me to move to Germany. I didn't want to go to Germany, so I resigned from that at huge risk because I didn't have a job to go to and uh, uh, lucked out, really, in a job in the defense industry with a company called Raycal that are now part of the Tallies Group, again, as an electronics engineer, uh, for a job that I was entirely ill-equipped for, actually. <laughs> and uh, uh, my wife will recounts, <laughs> it, recounts it all the time to friends. Uh, I spent two years where I did nothing but work and sleep, really, because uh, the job that I managed to bag was was above my uh, above my competencies, really. But I did learn an awful lot there, uh, and then I did some other stuff in the defense industry for a bit. Uh, um, but the thing that changed, really changed for me, was the day that I realized that I used to have reps and technical people used to come and visit me, and they talk about their yachts and their boats and their second homes, uh, and they were commercial people. Uh, really, they're engineers, but commercial engineers. Uh, and I thought, well, I'll, I'll have a go at some of that. So I joined a small company at the time, a small company up in Leeds uh, that were called Farnell as a sales engineer. So the job there, obviously, is you you design in, you attempt to design in uh, the kind of electronic components and electronic systems that they that they offer. 
uh, so that they get built into production runs and things and it makes money for the company. So uh, went and did that. Uh, and I won't go into this in too much detail, but my neurotype doesn't lend itself to that kind of work. But I was I was okay at it, actually. And so uh, spent probably the first five or six years doing lots of commercially based things. Um, and as you do, you kind of all the time you're 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 going up in rank, if you like, in inside the company. And then uh, Internet 1.0 happened, and that's really that was the big change in my career because all through my career there'd been quite a hardcore technology element to it. So I put first token ring networking at a company back in the day when network computers became a thing. So I kind of grew up around the 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 third industrial age as people like to talk about it. And um, so the internet happening was very significant for that company because. Uh, essentially, the, the the macroeconomics associated with what they did were very high volumes of very low value product where the operating costs were of huge significance. And the operating model for those kinds of organizations, and you'll remember, it used to be colored catalogs, very expensive colored catalogs and call centers. And call centers are very expensive because they're full of people and catalogs are very expensive and they go out of date very quickly. And so, of course, the online model lends itself really well to that kind of business and there's other parallel businesses the same for which is true stationary companies uh we all know amazon now books we know what jeff bezos did with amazon but it's exactly the same model you're looking for that model whereby um the profitability is dominated by operating cost and reduction of operating cost by transformation was the was the secret to success so uh then did a load of stuff and a load of consulting which is too much detail to go into uh, for many years but constantly with this theme of going to vertical other verticals other organizations uh, often as a hired gun um, to to lead, specify, scope up, lead these big transformation programs to to transform their operating model from typically call center, ERP, um, catalog based into what you'd now sort of what you'd now refer to as a digital model. Um, so there were various challenges on the front end. Obviously, there was a, the internet wasn't fit for purpose in many ways, uh, credit card concerns, all that kind of stuff. But also in the back end. Um, uh, enterprise resource and planning systems or ERP were dominated by the big five in those days, J.D. Edwards, PeopleSoft, Oracle, those kinds of companies. And those monolithic technology platforms uh, didn't talk to each other deliberately. There was a, there's actually a, a mirror today in today's public cloud world, but almost it's not. it wasn't in the vested interest of the vendors to allow interoperability from the systems. And the company that I worked for grew via acquisition. So buying other companies uh, all over the world, but primarily in, in the United States. So I spent a lot of time working in the United States, in, in, in California and, and uh, Chicago. And um, so we had to come up with a range of technologies that allowed a very fast integration in the enterprise IT space. I won't go into that too much because it's really, really techy. Um, so to do that, some of the technology that was needed didn't exist. So uh, we started a small company with a couple of colleagues. Uh, we we generated some IP and, and, and built some code. So I sold code back to my own company and other companies, essentially allowing integrate as an integrator across ERP platforms and integrating that up to uh, up to internet. So did a, that, that's the kind of gives you a shape of my career and all the time I'm getting a bit more senior in level until eventually I'm kind of leading um, programs of all sorts of things uh, across the organization. Uh, and then one day realized that my kids were growing up um, uh, that I hadn't seen a lot of them when they were little because uh, I'd been based in Devon for much of this time, nearly all of this time actually, and been working all over the world and made a life change decision to try and find a job that was local to me. And by happenstance, really, that an ex colleague uh, had become, uh, was working at the Met Office and there was a position open to revamp their website. Uh, and uh, it was before apps were a thing. So it was about 14 years ago, 15 years ago. Um, and uh, so I moved to the Met Office, uh, took a two-thirds pay cut uh, in doing so, and stepped down a number of levels through the organization to work in the public sector. And I'll be honest, I only did it because, well, A, I was privileged enough to have largely made the money to allow me to do it. So that's an important point of privilege. Um, so taking the pay cut was was a big thing for the family, but we talked about it and we all accepted the change of lifestyle that, that, were being, you know, that would occur by doing that. Um, but I went there really because it was in Devon. Um, that's the reason I went, but the reason I stayed was, uh, and sorry if this sounds a bit prosaic, but, you know, discovering a new form of career that allows me to make a difference to the world that I live in has become hugely important to me. So the reason I went there was because it was in Devon, but the reason I've stayed is because, uh, I've kind of bought into the, to the public good that you can generate in this kind of role. 
today's role obviously as director of technology i should probably finish off with that given there i've been there is is accountability for the very very wide spectrum of technologies that the that the met office uh kind of uh use to to do their business really and that's a unbelievably wide remit and uh now's the time to be humble you know i'm not an expert in anything so if on one thing i'm a kind of overseeing dot joiner uh, where I've got experts privileged enough to have experts in each of the relevant domains of technology that we may or may not get into that we use at the Met Office. I'm quite fascinated by the fact that you, even though I know you worked in the army and you, you did a relatively technical role Royal Air Force, there, please, not army. Nothing That's wrong with the army, but it was the Royal Air Force. Just that. <laughs> the RAF. Excuse, excuse me, Charlie. Um, and then you, you, you were an avionics engineer and you did electronics design, but you're not from a traditional IT or software background in, from that part of your life, um, which, uh, you know, I wouldn't say it's a rarity, but it is quite a little bit irregular. Most CIOs tend to be from that world. Um, and I, I love the fact you, you you were a salesman and you had such a commercial, you had, you had many commercial roles uh, for quite some time as well. Now, I listened to a, you on a different podcast um, that I, refer, I I alluded to prior to the to, to us recording, um, 101, I think it was called. And um, I was, you know, I was very impressed by how technical you are. Uh, you're obviously a very technical guy. I think you naturally are interested in this stuff anyway. You know, when you went into this CIO role, did you feel that you had the technical uh, knowledge to sort of, uh, you know, have that big job? Do you know what I mean? Or were you quite nervous going into it? Because you must have thought about this through the interview process. I suppose the technical bent came from, I'm a naturally STEMI person. Um, when it came to the Met Office, and I'll come back to imposter syndrome a little bit later, I was intimidated by many things, but not the technical element. Because the job that I'd got originally went in to do was a fairly, well, it was a high level, but it wasn't the top level of the organization to do digital transformation, something that I was very, very well equipped to do at a, every level, frankly, um, technically, te- technical and otherwise. Um, the job of CIO came along about four years after that. Um, so the uh, incumbent CIO um, resigned. And so the job came up for competition and uh, I, I applied and uh, against some external competition and was fortunate enough to get it. So in that instance, yes. I felt inequipped, ill-equipped to do it. Subsequently, I don't think I was ill-equipped to do it, but I certainly felt that way. Uh, and I found it hugely intimidating, um, uh, just given the, the the kind of supercomputers and those kinds of things, you know, working with world-leading computer scientists, uh, you know, how's this going to pan out? Because frankly, I don't have a degree in computer science. I have a degree in electronics. That's a different thing altogether. In fact, I don't have a degree. I have a higher uh, national diploma. So, but the, the the going to the Met Office, the intimidating part was really this transition from the private sector to the public sector because the drivers are very different. And as I say, I'm now hooked on that public mission and the generation of public good and the difference that just nudging the needle a little bit at a place like the Met Office can have a big impact on our world. You know, I'm someone who is from a commercial background and trying to sort of obviously forge a career within the technology space. And you do feel a little bit like an imposter sometimes, but I think people who have who are sort of more... Um, adept on the on the commercial or people side uh, generally have skills which um, you know have have some good skills which but you know could be used in that industry very you know or, or could be utilized in that industry very well so it's good to see people coming from that background into senior technology leadership roles like CIO, you know the CIO, CIO role you've got and so on and so forth so I mean look yeah, this is a function of diversity and I think one thing that that for for young people that may or may not listen to this kind of thing you know uh not to be intimidated if they're not hardcore command line, you know, coders. Um, That doesn't mean that there isn't a good career for you in technology because ultimately you absolutely need experts. You absolutely do need those people that are computer scientists and hardcore coders and so on and so forth. But to actually deliver value, you need the perspective of other people, particularly if those people are representative or even better are the users of whatever it is you're trying to do. So there's a place for everybody in, in, in technology there's no escaping the need for you know to have these intrinsic logical progressive if you like maths based uh skills you, you, there's no getting away from that at all but but that aside uh, it's a very accommodating kind of career <laughs> It's a bit like rugby, I suppose, isn't it? There's a, there's a position for every body shapes, types, you know? Uh, so maybe we can come back to rugby as well. So, But we talked about a really important milestone in your career, that decision, taking the pay cut, sitting down with your family and making that decision to join the Met Office. But maybe aside from that one, what were the, were the sort of non-obvious milestones in your career, things that really changed the direction of where you were going? I was a natural fit for the armed forces. Um, in some ways, there's a lot of your life that's structured for you. Uh, and uh, that, that for my neurotype is is a very comfortable place to be. Other people uh, kind of taking care of some of some of, some of uh, what you need to do and a good tidy structure to work within work. So that was a, a big one. Leaving the RAF where I was 
very successful, frankly, doing very well, um, to take a, what well, I didn't have a job to go to. And that game was based on personal reasons, was a big decision to make, but turned out to work out okay. It, it, it turned out to be okay. I didn't know that at the time I made the decision, of course, but it did turn out to be okay. Again, going into the, that that kind of commercial role. So the next big thing was was deciding to go into a commercial role as to an engineering role, and that linked back to rugby a little bit. I mean, you know, any rugby player aspires to ultimately represent the country, be brilliant, and, and get paid to do it, but hardly anybody does. There comes a point in time whereby you realize that you're not going to be a supremo. In, in an engineering sense, look, I was a good engineer, but I wasn't the best engineer. And uh, that didn't really appeal. So that was that was part of the okay, uh, engineering isn't quite doing it for me uh, in some um, hard to grasp, indistinct kind of way that helped me make the decision to move from hardcore engineering into initially a very commercial role. It was very commercial initially. It became more and more technical quite quickly, but but actually the job that I interviewed and secured was was a commercial role. What's common in all of those, I think, was backing myself um, and backing my, well, what you, we're all used to this word, um, welfare these days in mental health you know i think i think what i was doing really was making decisions that that took my mental health seriously i don't want to over over egg that too much but i was not unhappy but i wasn't as happy as i thought i should be <laughs> in all those occasions and so it was a mix of personal and professional things all jumbled up um whereas i do think i see i see uh, a lot of particularly young people that tend to prioritize things like their salary above everything else uh, and, you know, if I've got one piece of advice for, for younger people, early career people, it would be, you know, that that's typically a mistake because sooner enough, uh, the money alone doesn't make you happy. And I'm sure you, like me, you've got lots of rich friends and, uh, and, and so on. And money's not the route to happiness. Uh, and so for me, it's a, it's an eclectic blend of stuff that comes into decision-making and even in professional context, even making a technical decision, um, at the Met Office it's not just about the technology. There are, there are absolutely other factors. You know, if I put it in a more technical sense, you know, people processing technology are what deliver value. And so, so thinking that you can make technology decisions in isolation is, is a misnomer. It's, it's, it can't be that way. Um, so you have to account for these, how are we going to change? That's the process angle. How are we going to change things um, from a process perspective, a way of working perspective, we're going to insource, outsource, we're going to work collaboratively as teams. Um, all these things should be part of decision making in my view as opposed to um always doing the uh i think it's often quoted to einstein but i'm not sure it was really him that said it but you know you've got a choice really you can either seek to um uh make the measurable important or make the uh or, or make the important measurable and uh, i'm a big fan we're all big fans of being able to measure progress and so on but sometimes it's too easy to drop back to things like salary those things that are easy to measure and write down your pros and cons list and forget those things that are slightly harder to measure, but are definitely important. Uh, and one's welfare, I think, it, for me, has always been, you know, being the selfish, self-indulgent person that I am. Um, you know, my own welfare and my family's welfare figure pretty high on that list. Your role is, is a high-profile role, okay? But as the CIO of the Met Office, you know, probably got a, got a lot of pressure on you at times. But ultimately, you know, I mean, you could easily turn into a workaholic and work the weekends and work every hour, all hours under the sun, I suppose, in that type of role. How do you sort of structure your week generally and when do you have the cutoff point? And, you know, how do you basically ensure that you get some mental downtime so the, the Met Office gets the best version of Charlie? Yeah, 100 percent. And you've said that you've said exactly the right words, the best version. The best version isn't, you know, slogging uh, well beyond your 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 capacity and your resilience levels. That said, there are times when. And I'm in one of them right now when the sprint is the important thing. And there are times that I do work uh, hours that I shouldn't and, um, and and invade on my family and personal time to quite a large extent. But that can't go on forever. So what I am careful to manage is the kind of long haul. When do I, when and how am I going to orchestrate a position where I'm no longer sprinting at top whack and I can settle back into a decent cadence that I can sustain over, over the duration? Another thing that, that you learn over time is the kind of actions that you need to take while sprinting harder than you think you can maintain, probably mean you have to sprint a little bit harder. So recruitment's a, a, a classic example whereby, you know, I'm sure every, anybody that's, that's worked at managerial levels will recognize those times when they're just so busy, they've potentially got the budget to increase the size of their team, but they haven't got the time to recruit. And those are the kind of moments whereby you've got to make time for that recruitment. You've got to make time for that training of the team or, or, or delegating some work 
you've got to make those times to do that because otherwise you just get into this this horrible cycle of sprinting faster and faster and faster and sooner or later you're going to fall over right you're just going to fall over it's easy to get into that vicious cycle isn't it of, of keeping your team too small let's talk about 2020 then I suppose we can chuck in the first five months of 2021 as well. Hopefully we're returning to a little a little bit of normality now. What did you learn about yourself and your organization during the pandemic period, during the two lockdowns? Ooh, oh, crikey, that's a big question. Um, so right at the start of the incident, um, we were in a, and, and this is no reflection of me, by the way, the organization, the Met Office, had worked really hard ahead of the COVID event in recognition that... Um, defining the place of work as a single central factory that you need to turn up every day probably wasn't the future model. So in a much, obviously we've thought about this a lot more and, and, and attention has been focused by COVID, but we were already on that track. So we've done a lot of work on flexible working. We've done a lot of, we had a program called No Exeter, which was more of a resilience kind of piece of work. Um, we've been very active in, in moving workload to public cloud. And one of the reasons to move workload to public cloud is for additional resilience that I simply can't offer on on uh, on on-premise data centers and so on and so on. So we've done a lot of work ahead of COVID um, in the science and research areas. You know, a typical scientist uh, will have, you know, if he's a computational scientist, might have access to something like supercomputer, but will typically have a big computer at their desk, local storage to to do the things they want to do. And that's the typical model that you'll find in a research institute or organization. We'd already matured beyond that and already migrated our scientists to, um, virtual infrastructure that was centralized and, and sold them the benefits of, of of more power and more availability by central. So uh, similarly, we were already adopting big adopters of Office 365 and Microsoft Teams and Skype for business and those kinds of things. So we were, we'd already replaced our PSTN, our, our, our um, traditional copper telephone networks with, um, with uh, voice over IP. So we'd done all this stuff before COVID happened. So we were in a, a brilliant place. Um, and uh, I'm not saying we found it easy, but but it certainly didn't um, uh, it didn't didn't kill us to migrate to a fully remote uh, world, and we did that in the course of about fourteen days. We went from broadly two thousand people in the extra site to broadly nobody at the extra site, or very very few people on the extra site, including all the operational forecasting and so on and so on. And it wasn't easy, but it was it was achievable, and it was achievable without taking too many technology shortcuts. So one thing that worries me is many organisations that perform magnificently over COVID. But some of them uh, have definitely created future problems by having to move too quick. So uh, now in amongst that, like all other organizations, we've become acutely aware of the, the downsides, if you like, of remote working, particularly for those that have got you know, kids or, or local contexts or neurotypes or don't have a spare bedroom or somewhere that they can work from. Um, so all of these are, are problems that we've, uh, like all other organizations that we've kind of encountered and are dealing with as we go. Uh, I'm sure you're going to ask what you think. The fu- what I think the future looks like. Short answer is I don't know. It'll be some mix, but I don't think it will ever go back. The, the The future normal will never be the old normal. That's for sure. Um, in measurable ways, uh, you know, we ask and we poll us, our, our people a lot on this kind of thing. Many people do want to spend a significant fraction of their working day outside of a, a factory. Um, I, I use that word uh, deliberately, disingenuously, but you know what I mean. At a central place of work. Um, uh, some people aren't equipped to do that. That's absolutely fine. Um, but some people absolutely do uh, want to do that. Uh, our productivity, so all our measures that we can see, it's not universal by any means, but generally productivity is higher, not lower. Now, you can attribute that to many things. It might be that people are working longer hours because they feel they've got nothing better to do or, they've, they, they, or they feel they have to or whatever. So I'm not suggesting necessarily that it's a more efficient model. I'm well, just not commuting. Yeah, well, th- th- that is a thing. I think there's a lot of people, and I'm one of them, that use the two hours that I'm not commuting. I do two hours more work, which you know seems like seems reasonable enough, actually. Um, but anyway, I wouldn't project my, my, my working balance on others. So the organization has done very well in short, uh, very well indeed. We've, we're learning. We've learned and continue to learn a load of lessons. The fact that, you know, individual, everybody's different. Everybody's on a spectrum. There isn't such a thing as a normal person. So, so, and I think most organizations have now recognized that when you come to people, there isn't a stereotype, there isn't a standard, and therefore one size fits all is extremely unlikely to be a good strategy. That's really what I'm saying. So on the people side, huge amount of positive uh, lessons around the importance of the individual, the importance of welfare. You mentioned it earlier on, you know, sustainable 
how do you get how do you get people to turn up and do their best for you every day that's by giving them sustainable work to do good prioritization good focus and we've got a long way to go like i'm sure most organizations in in uh getting some of those things right so that's on that side of things for my side of things uh, so when i was working in the americas i mentioned that i spent a lot of time in america and i did but i also spent a lot of time working from home in fact in the shed that i'm in now uh this shed was a purpose-built office way back when that i had to uh, reclaim from the from the country rats actually at the start of covid um because it had become a dumping <laughs> ground um but the uh, but but i had some fairly significant mental health issues when uh, when i was working in uh, in that environment because I spent very extended periods of time working on my own, interacting back in those days, not even as good as as as, as Zoom or Teams or, or whatever. Uh, it was teleconferences, and I got into a pretty bad state, actually. That was probably 2006, something like that. And so you always learn from these things. Uh, I'm very careful with myself um, in terms of getting too isolated. I've been hugely fortunate. My wider family, my three kids and their partners, descended on the family home, mostly for the duration of COVID. So they too uh, weren't working anywhere um, and they decided they would rather work from home in Devon than they would from their uh, typically urban flats and things. Uh, so we've we've had a little community, a little commune here, which has been really good. And I think I've, again, another privilege, had a really big focus on the on tendering for and awarding the contract for our next big supercomputing platform. And that's been a that's been a such a big blazing uh, existential uh, priority that we've that, that that's given me a really good thing to focus on um uh, and for the teams obviously to focus the teams on here's the here's the steps that we just need to get done so yeah good things and bad things both personally and professionally but i think it all ends up when you throw it in the air that uh, that, that this is what sets my opinion that the future normal isn't going to be isn't going to look like the old normal and nor should it that resonates with me certainly and i'm sure it will with lots of the listeners but uh, i wanted to dig into or latch onto something you mentioned there and something you've mentioned a couple of times over the course of this conversation is uh, neurotypes okay and I want to talk about bespoke man management you know you and I sports fans whenever I've read a lot of literature on sport and um, I think one thing that keeps coming up is the best managers or the best leaders within the sporting world is often down to their man management skills having a bespoke approach for the type of person they're managing and not trying to have blanket management styles and I I can certainly see that you you are of that school of thought as well can you tell us what you mean by neurotypes and how does that influence your leadership style yeah sure uh, and I'm not going to medicalize this whilst at the same time I'm going to recognize that for others medicalizing to enable that they get the right kind of support uh, and the right structures is important for my personal choice has been that I'm not so I'm going to talk in quite generic terms but uh, you know specifically things like um, um, autism and Asperger's and so on are are, are, are conditions um, and they represent a uh, a certain clutch of neurotypes where you can almost identify a population of people that share a common neurotype so if you like you've got neuronormal and you've got people like uh, you know or the autistic community uh, or, or the Asperger's community whereby they too have identifiable common um, uh, attributes and and like you know like any a facet of neuro there's no good and bad in any of this um, we have a we have a, a disproportionately large community of of um, people who identify with autism at the Met Office, and they've got some ninja super skills typically, uh, as well as some 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 areas that that, that you need to take account for. Um, and I won't dig into that too much, but because I sit on, uh, if you like, I've got a, a, a non neuro normal neurotype so i'm not i don't sit in a in the in the middle of a, a standard distribution of neurotypes i sit quite 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 on one end um i have the need to learn a lot so in terms of social interaction for example i don't find any of that easy and the benefit of not being very good at something exactly the same applies to rugby is is i was never a gifted uh rugby player that you know had this innate ability to step onto a grace a rugby pitch and, and and make all the right moves in the right places um but i was a pretty good learner so if I was told what to do, I was pretty physical and pretty, you know, um, and, and if told what to do in a good structure, I was, I was reasonably good at cracking on and doing what I was told to do. So uh, my local rugby club, uh, to extend that story a little bit, um, uh, used to play a number of leagues lower than a rugby club I played for in Wales. Um, but the reason that I didn't get on there was it was a bunch of superstars that used to just turn onto the pitch and, you know, and do what they did. Um, and as they say, get their heads up and play the game. And there's nothing wrong with that. And indeed, it's great to watch that kind of skill and that kind of gift. Whereas the team that I played for in Wales, 
Um, it was all very structured. Welsh rugby at the time was much more structured than English rugby. And I was clearly told what to do. I was told to do in what area of the pitch or what kind of play. And I responded really well to that, which is why counterintuitively I couldn't get into my home side, uh, but I could get into a higher at a higher level. And I think the same, all of that translates to the professional life, I think. I think when you've had to learn something because you don't, you're not naturally gifted and you're not natural, uh, I won't say a natural leader per se, but, but uh, you know, when you've had to learn about yourself a little bit as opposed to just turn up and do it without really thinking about it, that has its benefits. And its benefits is perhaps that you can identify the bespoke needs of others and other groups and, and you can, um, and that's, other people might call this cynical, but you can figure out the drivers and you can figure out the things that you need to do to get that community to the place that you need them to be, perhaps. Um, very much speculation, but that's how I'd speculate. So I think, you know, if, if, if I'm good at some of this stuff, it's because I've had to learn. It's, it's, it's not the, not the thing you might go to that, you, you know, uh, that, that, that you're, you're gifted from the offset. In fact, quite the reverse. You've had to work hard at it. And by working hard at it, you've learned some of the recipes. The same principle as why great players don't necessarily make great managers, isn't it? Yeah. hundred percent. The not so good players, Jose Mourinho, for example, or, you know, Ferguson or whatever he was, you know, he was a decent player, but but you know what I mean. The world superstar players don't necessarily make great managers, do they? And I think it's, it's a similar principle to what you're saying. Thank you for tuning in. Um, I just want to take this opportunity to thank some of our friends. Firstly, all round tech PR superstars Nelson Bostock. Whether you're an established technology brand or a fast growing fintech. Um, you need the right team behind you, a team that understands your brand, your purpose, your goals, and, and can really help you define your narrative and tell your story, the story that matters. Um, these guys tick all of those boxes and more. Um, you can find them at nelsonbostock.com. That's Nelson Bostock, the CK on the end, .com. Highly recommended. Um, I also want to thank Tramshed Tech. Um, we've come down here and they kindly allowed us to, 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 to use their world-class recording studio facility down here. Um, but they do office space, they do events. Um, I can't recommend them enough. That's Tram Shed Tech. And also a big shout out to Be Digital, uh, who, who make all this possible. Uh, Be Digital enable organizations to become lean, agile, and to attract the right talent. That's BeDigitalUK.com. Let's talk about supercomputers then. It had to come up at some point, didn't it? <laughs> um, I tell you what, before we go there, talk us through how, in layman's terms, how how do the Met Office predict the weather? So the weather is, um, what we're really doing at some higher class of order of things is trying to say something about the future state of something. So we're trying to predict. So it's important to note that in prediction, a prediction is is never going to be right or wrong it's 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 all about the degree of right or wrong that it is and that might sound counterintuitive because we're all sat in our own point of space and time and it either rains or it doesn't right so so at some level there's a truism that that, that and that's called determinism but the weather um isn't isn't deterministic uh, and there's features of chaos in it. I won't go into this in too much uh, in too much detail. But a, a mathematician called Ed Lorenz back in the '60s uh, was the first person to enumerate chaos. People think it came from the particle physicists, but it didn't. It came from the it came from the weather weather industry, really. And so, to some degree, there is no way that you can, with ultimate fidelity and 100% accuracy, say what the future is going to bring. And I think uh, you know we all know that recent experience over COVID, and you hear the scientists saying all the time that you know policy is going to be led by the data uh, what the data says and it's not going to be led by projections and what they're really saying there is you can uh, you can look backwards and definitely say what's happened so if you like that's data as it describes a fact when you start to look forward then by definition data can only be described as an opinion uh, and 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 that's the that's the best that you can possibly do so going back to how we forecast the weather it all starts off with gaining facts or an observations program. And we take in billions of observations from all over the world, from satellite, uh, um, uh, atmosphere, land, marine-based observations platforms. A lot of this is in the form of satellite. And what all that information does is allow us to paint a picture of what the atmosphere is doing right now. And if you like, that's fact. That's factual. What we then do is we run a very large research program uh, of very accomplished scientists who... Um, uh, who who use the laws of physics ultimately 
to apply those laws of physics at scale in a computer model of the atmosphere where they take in its current state, they apply things like the Navier-Stokes equations, you don't need to know what those are, uh, and, and, and physics, things like Boyle's law, Newton's third, conservation of energy and momentum, these kinds of things that we've all forgotten since we went to secondary school. Um, and they apply those things at vast scale on that knowledge of what the atmosphere is doing right now to be able to wind it forward in time and predict its future state. So that at some level, and that might be a weather forecast, or it might be in some uh, slightly different sense, a climate forecast where you're working at higher level cross globe over a longer period of time. So, so, um, but, the, but the same principle is true. In order to do that, going back to the, the, these computational uh, models, the atmospheric models, these things are, uh, there's no human relatable way to describe just how much computational power they take to run. And if you just think about it for a minute and you think about, you know, how winds form, how pressure fronts move, how the atmosphere moves all across the globe, because you can't do this thing just for the UK. You have to do, uh, somebody somewhere has to be running what's happening at the global level before you can zoom in on the UK uh, to say what might be happening in the UK. So it takes enormous computational power to run these, these models. And that's magnified because... Um, when you run a, a, a certainly a climate model, for example, it's not just about the atmosphere. It's about what the land's doing. It's about what the ice is doing. It's about what the oceans are doing. So it gets, you know, you end up running a full earth simulation, if you like, of the environmental state of, of, of the world. So massive uh, amount of computer power uh, required to do that. And that, that, that bit is fundamentally what we use the supercomputer for. Um, and a lot of that is, it's a mix, really. Um, computer scientists would talk about it in terms of capability and capacity, and they talk about it often from a computational front. front. One of the big challenges is actually um, input-output or actually moving data from one part of those equations being partially solved to another part of those equations being partially solved. So you need two things, really. You need lots of fast uh, interconnect and you need lots of computational power. And of course, what drops off the end of them are also massive um, in terms of sheer verbosity. So you also need lots of storage. So um, we used to use the word uh, HPC or high performance computing to as a generic term for which um, we, we used to talk about that. But we now talk specifically about supercomputers because it, it defines a subclass of, uh, of um, infrastructure that is not defined by public cloud. So public cloud is big, very, very big, but it's big in a different way. Um, we might come back into that uh, a little bit later, perhaps. But um, so when I say supercomputing, I don't, I don't, I mean it as a specific subclass of high performance computing, of which there are many types, including things like quantum and, and so on and so on. The weather we we get from the Met Office now, what's the sort of percentage accuracy we're looking at generally? You know, over the court, you know, looking at the data from the last, say, five years, because I know this stuff moves so quickly. So keep maybe in that time horizon. Yeah, very good. So um, there are benchmarks for these things, and they're, they're intrinsically quite technical and scientific. They're difficult to talk about. But what I can say is that progression, I can talk about progression, and, you know, everybody will have their own. Uh, they'll, they'll have their own opinion of how accurate they are or not based on, on personal circumstance. What I will say is there are there are some types of weather uh, the weather people refer to these as regimes. So, you know, you've heard the weather coming from the west or coming from the north, and you've heard about maritime air and continental air and so on. What, what they're referring to really are different types of weather. And some of those types of weather are more predictable than other types of weather. So one thing to note right now, for example, we're in, 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 in a westerly driven, highly convective, or southerly driven actually, very convective um, uh, weather type. And they're, they're kind of, you can't predict where it's a bit like uh, hurricanes in the, in in the Midwest. You can say there's a very high likelihood of them happening with a lot of confidence. What you can't do is say specifically where they'll occur. You can say this, you know, over this these 200 square miles, highly likely the hurricane's going to turn up this. And in in their own way, thunderstorms here in the UK are just the same. You can say there's a very high probability of thunderstorms in this area. What the science and technology doesn't allow you to do, and arguably. Uh, going back to chaos may never let you do is to say specifically where a thunderstorm is going to happen. So there are, there are, there are science and technology ways that we address that in things called now casting. There are other regimes that are eminently predictable. And, you know, you'll also be familiar with the types of weather patterns whereby the Met Office can issue a warning 10 or 15 days out for a specific event um, that, that that's going to happen. So um, first thing I'd say is depends on the type of weather that we're experiencing at the time. It also depends on the season. So generally, winter weather is easier to forecast than summer weather, generally. 
Um, and the other thing to mention is that we don't, uh, we increasingly look, going back to the probabilities, accuracy in terms of uh, the probability. So in other words, if we say there's a 40% probability of something happening, that should happen 40% of the time, 50%, 60%, and so on and so on. So what you'll see weather forecasts moving to as we go forwards, we'll ask a lot from the public because we're going to be trying to get um, uh, educate and inform the public to recognize that weather is intrinsically probabilistic and not deterministic in nature. So these percentages are a pretty bad way to describe it. And there's some R and D in in, a, in an area of science called informatics and visualization, where you can you can use visualized techniques to help get some of this information across. So it's all about the likelihood of something. So when we run a forecast, we don't actually run it once; we run it many, many times. Uh, and we it's, it's something. If you're familiar with mathematics, it's not it's not far away from a Monte Carlo, uh, but we call it, it, it specifically it's EPS, ensemble prediction systems, whereby we'll make slight differences to known capture errors in the current state of the atmosphere so obviously whilst we capture the state of the atmosphere we can't capture it perfectly at your house in your back garden that's just not not going to happen so we might measure 20 miles away or 30 miles away so firstly we know there are some uh potential er errors there and then secondarily and i've already mentioned it um i talked about the intrinsic chaos of some of these systems so uh what we also use is th things things called perturbed physics routines whereby we'll we'll perturbate what might happen around some known um, some known um, uh, brackets. And by doing those two things, they give you different forecast outcomes. So the same for weather forecast will have many, many different versions of it. And we use those many versions of it for to be able to express two things really in a slightly different. One is around, we can give you a probability of something happening. And then secondarily, we have a confidence in that probability and the two separate things. So I, I mentioned some types of weather being easier to predict than others. That's the confidence aspect. So I'll always have a probability. I might say, yeah, there's a 20% chance of rain in your back garden, Gareth. I might be very confident in that 20%, or I might not be very confident in that 20%. If, you, if you're in Wales, it's probably going to be well, more. Well, yeah, let, let's be more realistic, 95%. <laughs> um, the point is that if those, if those different yeah. weather forecasts that are about the same time are saying very different things about the weather then the confidence is low if they're all saying much the same thing about the weather then the confidence is high you end up with a probability even way either way so this is all tricky stuff and i apologize I'm, i it's one of my uh, i've gone probably gone a bit deep into that but um um suffice to say that you know progress is about a day a decade and what i mean by that is weather forecasts are uh, run at a rate uh, tr uh, when we look back whereby we can look at one extra day every 10 years with the same level of accuracy. Does that make sense? So a four-day forecast today is as accurate as a three-day forecast was in 2010. And that's kind of how we measure we measure ongoing improvement more so than, than, than benchmark. Well, we do, obviously, benchmark accuracy. But the way that we do that are in things like... Um, the, the 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 ability to forecast pressure in the mid atlantic in hectopascals at 800 you know it's it's a very complex and scientific uh uh thing to be able to do to measure to measure accuracy it's not it's not as simple as uh, you know 20% or 30% right it doesn't work that way i think it's fair to say the world has, ch has changed immeasurably in the last 10 years 15 years because of technology what is the next frontier of technology evolution for the met office do you think yeah, so let me talk about the important stuff first, which is the outcomes before I get to the technology. So in terms of outcomes, and people at the Met Office don't like me saying this, but there's only a limited number of people that are actually interested in the weather forecast. Most people are interested in a something forecast, where the something is the thing that they would like to do or avoid or, or whatever, according to a decision that they're going to make based partly on the weather. Right. So that's often much more often the circumstance is that actually people want to know about the weather, but they want to know about the weather because they want to barbecue or they want to cut their grass or they want to play cricket or they want to play rugby or whatever it might be. So um, decision making is our business, actually, and affording good decision making. So the, the purpose of the Met Office is to enable you to make better decisions to stay safe and thrive. And we take that purpose statement very, very, uh, very carefully. Now, that's not to diminish the importance of weather forecasts. They're super important. But actually... Uh, and moreover, it's not the Met Office's business to do things like cut your grass forecasts or have a barbecue forecast or whatever it might be. Um, so what we are doing is collaborating very widely with others in areas like, uh, you know, energy. So renewables is a good example. People want to know. They don't actually want to know how windy it's going to be. They want to know how much power they're going to generate. That's what they really want to know. So in that instance, we'd work with, you know, renewables partners to use our expertise in being able to say something about what the, 
what winds are going to look like and how gusty they're going to be so that they can ultimately deliver to the to the to the customer what the customer wants which is actually a power generation forecast or on a climatological time scale where do i build this piece of infrastructure do i build a wind farm here or here um do i build a thames flood barrier that's this big or that big so you can see you know at, at the at the I won't say trivial, but at the at the common level of cutting grasses and having barbecue, there's a series of stuff to do there. But actually, at the at the national level, there's stuff to do about national infrastructure, particularly in the context of a changing climate. So, as we all know, our weather's changing, and our weather's changing as a function of a changing climate. Uh, and we do a lot of research and a world leader in that kind of research. And so, you know, where where you would and wouldn't build a, a railway or a road today is not the way it might be in 10 or 20 years time so so the big horizon for outcomes for the met office is all about that i won't say switch it's extension working with others to move from what the weather's going to do to what the impact of the weather may be uh both now and in the future and enabling people to make better decisions be they policy makers be they public be they uh industry vertical so that's the that's the big outcome now to do that um this 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 um, greedy machine that wants big computers gets even greedier, right? So you got it, it, all of a sudden you're extending, you're going beyond what we've already talked about and into new territory. So one of the things that we did um, probably seven or eight years ago now was decided that we needed to go to where the crowd were and not expect the crowd to come to us. So what, that's code really for a big push into public cloud. Um, so we push a, uh, we push an awful lot of data into the public cloud, more data than than anybody I'd suggest in the in the public sector, um, so that that data is 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 available and useful to those kinds of collaborators that we need to work with to do those kinds of useful things uh, that goes well beyond weather forecasts. And and the same is true in climate, by the way, for everything that I refer to as weather because it's familiar for most people. The same thing applies to uh, to, to to climate. Um, so. That, that's been a big technology change for us. Um, and it's, there's been a number of drivers for that. I've mentioned another one earlier on in terms of resilience. Um, my opinion, uh, and I appreciate it's controversial for some, is that uh, I do not believe that I can compete or the Met Office should even try to compete to deliver the availability, efficiency, effectiveness of infrastructure independently to the public cloud providers it, it will be it seems to me to be a crazy thing to do um you know that that's what they do for a living it's part of what we do uh, and so that consolidation i believe is somewhat inexorable um so fairly recently so that's one big thing is this this move to making our data if you like more available and more useful to more use cases by by doing a lot of work on the public cloud and that in technical terms um there's a whole there's a whole thing to that so we've had to uh, mature into understanding how things like serverless technologies work, um, software as a service. We've had to make some compromises to the way that we've traditionally done things because it's not the way things are done in a standardized public cloud. We've had to equip people with new skills. We've had to uh, build new production pipelines and ways to get code built. Uh, so a whole gamut of things involved in that in that change. Back at the other end, um, there's there's a couple of areas that, that are worth note. Um, there's lots of changes going on in the way that we observe the world. So I, I briefly mentioned that satellites are super important and everybody knows about Elon Musk and the privatization of space and all that kind of stuff. So there's, there's changes coming on, technological changes coming along uh, from that direction. Um, we also know about the Internet of Things and our instrumented world. So whereby uh, back in the day, all of our observations came from um, <laughs> uh Stevenson screens for the aficionados would be something they'd recognize. But these things that look a bit like beehives in the middle of a field that you may, may not have seen, which are, are, are you know, old school weather observation sites. That's, that's where we got our observations from back in the day. Increasingly, those things are automated. And looking forward, there are, there are, there are billions of observation points available from the Internet of Things because everything you can think of, including your car and your cooker and your, your whatever you've got, is instrumented these days. So there's a big theme of work to get access to all those, uh, uh, the, the instrumentation that's out there uh, and to augment what we already do. So there's a big, big change coming there. Moving in a bit, supercomputing, I mentioned it briefly, uh, and I mentioned that we've been through a uh, tender process. Um, uh, so that tender process was issued, and, and uh, as you can imagine, for these very big tenders, there's a very, uh, uh, um, a very rigorous process for that that's overseen by by government. Um, and that's the, well, it's not anymore, but it was at the time, the OGU process, the, the European Common Tender process. So that process was gone through, uh, was competed for, and was ultimately secured by Microsoft. So uh, Microsoft have won that bid, 
And obviously, the fact that Microsoft have won that bid brings a whole new set of possibilities to the table because Microsoft are also one of these big cloud providers. So we do uh, an awful lot of work uh, with AWS, and that won't change. We've now got a new uh, a new uh, partner to work with uh, in Microsoft. And so um, I'm sure, can't say specifically what, but I'm sure there'll be lots of new technological things based on the fact that we've got a new 10-year um, relationship with uh, with Microsoft um, coming on board, and then what will what will us and Microsoft do together? And, and into highly speculative territory now, I can say with some surety about and sorry, it's a technical phrase, but the exploitation of heterogeneous architecture is definitely a thing. What I mean by that is, uh, I'll put it try and put it in plain terms. If you think of a supercomputer as a Formula One racing car that's designed to go, you know, do one thing and do one thing really well, um, it does that thing really well, but Everything that the Met Office does isn't racing, uh, isn't racing around tracks. We too need a car to go shopping with. We need, we too need a car to go touring with. We too need a car to do a drag race with. And that's what I, in technical terms, what I what I mean by heterogeneous or different architectures. So uh, one one big push for us, and it, uh, and it's it's quite detailed. We've got a program of work that's already been in existence for five years, which is all about really making sure that we can exploit different architectures to make sure that we're running the right work in the right computational uh, hardware and software infrastructure. Um, and, you know, today that means things like GPU technology um, uh, and, and some other, some other kind of areas, you, you know, GPUs uh, you, you'll have come across for, 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 for working things like machine learning um, workloads. So uh, exploiting that, but looking forward, things like quantum fall into that broad initiative to exploit heterogeneous architectures. For us, it's not prime time yet. Um, the time will come. It's not prime time for, for, for uh, three main reasons. There's still work to do for the for the innovators to get the hardware where it needs to be in terms of scale and reliability. Uh, that's progressing really well. There's the there's some maths research that needs to be done in the development of useful algorithms that we need to be able to perform the types of maths that we need to perform in our computational science. Um, uh, and then uh, the programming models, the way that you go about programming all that up and in, into production workloads, uh, that's also got got work to do. So in all three of those areas, the, the quantum will mature. But it's for us, it's not prime time. For other use cases, it is. Um, there are some, you know, you can already get a quantum computer to do a really good job at factoring prime numbers. Um, that's at the heart of of many of the security protocols that are out there today. So there's a there's a use case straight away for quantum computing. Um, but for the kind of work that we do, um, we need different algorithms, different maths, different programming models. So, um, so they're the they're the big, they're probably the biggest things that come to mind. Uh, would be a load of stuff about an, an ongoing journey to uh, public cloud, and and if you like democratizing. The, the science and technology that we do through data, that's kind of the gist of it, is, is making sure that the data is not data that you need a PhD in, in physics and maths to make any sense of, but data that you can do something useful with if you happen to be a, uh, I don't know, uh, uh, you know, cutting, cut, cut, I'm, I'm going to predict when is a good time to cut your grass uh, kind, of, kind, of, kind, of, kind of company. Um, Predictive so work, analytics, I think they call it, don't they? <laughs> yeah, and the other big thing that's pervasive across the whole of that spectrum is obviously artificial intelligence, or more specifically machine learning. Um, I've got my own personal views about the validity of artificial intelligence as a category, but I've certainly got no doubt about the, uh, the, the validity of machine learning. Um, we, we are using machine learning right across that spectrum um, in many, many different guises. Uh, supervised, unsupervised, and, uh, and all, all, all subcategories thus, uh, ranging from uh, machine learning as it helps to augment some of our science routines. Um, so there are ways in which you can imagine, talk about something like the formation of a cloud, you can intuitively imagine that if you're trying to use um, laws of physics to look at the evolution of a cloud, that's going to be really computationally expensive. You probably do need to know that how to learn how clouds are formed and how they operate. But once you've done that, then it's much more computationally it's cheaper computationally to apply a machine learning uh, algorithm to that kind of use case that will approximate the formation of clouds. It will approximate it pretty well, but it'll approximate it that's good enough, uh, and that saves you a lot of computational cost. So right at the sciencey end, there's, there's, there's those kinds of use cases, and then of course right at the front end, just like every other organisation, we can preempt predict what people's needs may or may not be. Um, uh, on websites, we can we can use machine learning to analyze 
how our employees use our systems and which bits of them work well for them, which of them don't, and all the other plethora of use cases that you've come across where machine learning applies. So uh, we've got some special ones that are probably a bit unique to us, and then we've got all the generic ones that have, that, 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 that everybody else do as well. So that's another really big uh uh, big change looking forward you mentioned elon musk earlier on i think spacex launched three british built satellites recently um with the you know i think one of them was built for something to do with uh, migration of, of of species um in africa and things um but but the other two were sort of um collecting data on, on climate change so i wanted to ask in terms of climate change what are the uk doing enough on the global stage to combat uh, the, 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 you know the, the threat of climate change in your opinion oh that's a that's a loaded question um what i will say is the met office are recognized as world leaders in in the whole area um the uk were very early to recognize climate change uh, and something called the hadley center which is a, a part of the met office in association with one of the research councils called NERC, the natural england research council that is an institute dedicated to uh, cl- uh, to climate research in the UK and is a world leader. So that's for sure. We've got other institutes around the UK and other other research universities. I won't call them out because I'll miss one. Uh, they're also up there right at the very top of researching climate change. So from that perspective, you know, I'm not going to go into policy. Should we be doing more or less? I'll leave that to others that are better well qualified. But certainly from a science and research point of view, um, we are do- we're doing well. We are doing well. Um, there are so, so I would argue, you know, that, that that's not a bad place to be at all. Um, climate research really falls into three areas, and it started off with attribution. So, you know, right back in the 70s, probably earlier than that, it was all a case of, are we seeing, is climate change a thing? And if it's a thing, what's causing it? And that's where CO2 emissions and greenhouse gases and all those things that we're now familiar with. So I won't say that's done because there are elements, sub-elements of attribution that are still super important. You know, more specifically, what what are the things that really drive climate change and what can we do about them is still an important thing to work. And then you've got kind of mitigation, uh, uh, mitigation approaches. So what can we do to mitigate the changes that are taking place. And so examples of those are, you know, policies such as moving to electric cars, electric vehicles, uh, emissions targets, these kinds of things are all uh, mitigations, um, uh, mitigations to try and reduce the, uh, the, the, the climate change that's happening. But finally, and you, you know, you'll be familiar with, sadly, we're in a position where we've also already got to adapt. So adaptation is the is the final area. And that's the fact that, you know, an element of climate change and changing weather is now inescapable. Uh, and we can we can argue about the degree of that, but it's happening. So you get into science and research that's all about what does a building need to look like to accommodate with a hot British summer in 2040? Because let's not build houses that, you know, are sun traps to that degree now because they'll be 100 degrees by the time we get to 2040. So there's a huge amount of work to do in terms of adaptation, you know, uh, and you'll, you'll have seen it in, in popular, in, in, in all the kind of popular press about things like floodplains and the need to protect them and all these kinds of things. And I'm not an expert in any of those fields, but I, but, but I will say that, you know, in all of those areas, demonstrably, the UK on the science and research side of things uh, are, are very, very active uh, and certainly lead the global stage. So we've got the next uh, COP um, uh, up in Scotland uh, le- uh, later on uh, next year. Uh, and we're hosting that, and it's a great opportunity for the, for the UK. Indeed, the Met Office will be there. Um, it's a great opportunity to take another look at the global situation around climate change, and the UK will very much be at the forefront. So, look, um, you know, you'll appreciate uh, I'm not going to go into too much personal opinion by that, and like, like always, we can do more, but I think we should be proud of what we have done uh, and the work that we do do because it's it's pretty significant stuff in global terms. Obviously, being exposed to the data you've, you're exposed to and seeing what you've seen in the last 12 years, what advice would you give to the sort of average man in the street in terms of just doing a little bit or doing something to help with a bigger cause of combating climate change? Yeah, I mean, look, uh, I'm a big believer uh, in the cumulative effect of lots of little changes. Huge believer of this. And, you know, we could go back to organisational theory and the importance of culture and getting people to just do something a little bit different every day. And I'm very much in that camp. Um, and look, I'm not going to I'm not qualified. What I can do is comment on what my family have done. So let me do that. And, and and please don't, for anybody, take this as, as you know, sage advice because I'm not an expert in this area. But we've had a good talk about it. Um, we've taken a look at our, our use of vehicles and the types of vehicles that we drive. And to the extent that we can afford to, we've moved to more efficient vehicles, even if there's a – goes back to earlier comments that I've made – as part of a decision where I haven't just been driven by the money. So I'll be honest, at the moment, it costs a bit more uh, potentially to have a more efficient vehicle. 
counterintuitively because the only cost there isn't obviously you've got purchase price and, 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 and all that kind of stuff. So we've done a bit of that as a family. We've done quite a lot in, in where we source our food from. Um, so, you know, uh, controversial again, uh, I am a, I am a meat eater for sure, but we tried to cut down on the amount of meat that we eat, um, recognizing that it plays an important part in, in, in carbon emission, um, the way that we recycle and, and try and reuse. And uh, so these kinds of small things are, again, I'm no expert. I have no idea that agree to which you add those things up and you end up solving a problem. I, I it's, it, that's just not my, I'm not qualified to have a view on that, but I did, but, but, but I am a, a general believer in, in, uh, the, the power of many small, many small things. Um, the, another part to do that and to have a conversation and a good think about it, I think, is the degree to which you can then look at big policy decisions that are made, some of which will be less than palatable for many, uh, fully understand that, and recognize why they're more important than something to squabble about from, from, from kind of trite and, and self-vested um, self-centered reasons you know th- this is i think it was spock wasn't it i'm sure somebody better than spock said it but the, the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few or something um uh, i'm sure somebody more laudable than spock said it but i remember it from star trek too i think yeah uh, <laughs> um the point here is you know we live on a finite resource we live on one planet uh and uh, the more that we can all do to try and think in those terms and just remember that our parochial and it's tough it is tough uh, we all we all live and experience our own lives, but we're all part of a community that live on a finite resource that isn't doing terribly well at the moment. Um, so just being open to that conversation is, is a huge start. We're coming towards the end then. So I just wanted to finish on these two questions, um, which I ask every guest right at the end. So what is the best piece of leadership advice you have ever received? Uh, this sounds trite and trivial, but it was actually be yourself. Um, and so, uh, I've talked a bit about imposter, syn- imposter syndrome and those occasions. And, and, you know, most of us experience it more than once in our career where for whatever reason you get put into a job that you feel ill equipped for. And my response to that was, um, was to try and be the person that I thought I needed to be, uh, kind of wearing a mask and a facade and, and behaving in a way rather than the person I actually was. And, uh, it was a huge mistake and it was noticed by uh, an ex colleague of mine, Dame Professor Julia Slingo who was once the, uh, once the chief scientist at the Met Office. And uh, when I first got the job uh, as technology director, she said, Charlie, you know, why are you trying to be something different to the reason that we gave you the job? And, uh, you know, be yourself uh, and be comfortable in your own skin. And uh, that's, that's easy to say, but tricky to do. I think that's brilliant advice. It's really uh, the simple ones and the, and the old fashioned ones are the best ones normally, aren't they? So last one then. So what person, book or story have you been inspired by? Oh, you're not going to like this very much, but it was a it was a book that I read when I was a kid, um, which was ultimately turned into a film called Blade Runner, which is is very widely known, which was uh, do I'll probably get this wrong now, but it's I think it was uh, do robots dream of electric sheep was the original book. And it was a glimpse into the future for, for me when I, when I initially read it, which gave me a sense of just how important technology was, what a significant impact it could have on the rest of the world. It was, what, it was actually that alongside a heap of, of, of sci-fi stuff, Star Wars, Star Trek, all that kind of stuff, um, that, really, uh, that really steered me into, into the direction it ultimately took. So, um, yeah, I am very much, uh, very much driven by pulp sci-fi. The other thing that those things tell you is is it's okay to kind of dream. It's okay to um, it's okay to extrapolate beyond beyond reality, because by by daring to dream and by daring to you know I don't know if you ever read a book by Isaac Asimov or any of those kinds of people, but they're big grand alternative visions of what the future might be like. And it's not that I'm naive enough to think that the world's ever going to be like that, but but having those thinking makes you go back to your life and rethink some of the little things that you probably never thought about before. Um, so, so the reason why they've had a big impact as a collection, which I've kind of, you know, uh, uh, simplified into, into, into one book is, is because I try and do that work all the time. I try and not allow reality to be the constraint of a vision. Now, of course, you've got to be pragmatic and then ultimately compromise on that vision because whether you like it or not, the grim reality of today is the way it is. But I think having a, having a compelling direction or a compelling vision is super, super important, even if it's a, uh, intended destination that you don't really think you're ever going to make just being persistent about well that's where i'd like to be so i'm going to shoot as hard towards that place as i possibly can i think is important both personally and professionally such as an important component of being a successful leader so uh, so i'm glad you brought that one up charlie so look um, we've gone over but i've really enjoyed our conversation so i really appreciate you taking the time to do this charlie i know you're a really busy chap so um 
Thanks for coming on the Tech Leaders podcast. One final question, though. Are the Lions going to win in South Africa? Yeah, of course they are. Of course they are. So long, so, so, long as they, uh, so long as it's not the entire Welsh national side that constantly gets picked for everyone. I won't go any further than that. Well, a couple let's of them have been injured. <laughs> let's, have a bit of mi- let's have a bit of mix in there. But uh, yeah. Yeah, so. definitely. Uh, Gareth, sure really, really nice to meet you. And thanks for the opportunity. I appreciate it. Likewise. Thanks, Charlie. Thanks. If you enjoyed and took value from the show, then don't forget to subscribe and also feel free to leave a review. We would really appreciate it. Thank you so much for listening.